Hello. Good evening, everyone, um, uh, with us here in space and online. Uh, my name is Nicholas Tomancho. I'm head of the Department of Architecture at MIT, and I'm having this weird experience that I've been having all week now of meeting people in person for the first time that I've only met on Zoom over across the last 15 months, which is, frankly, a great pleasure, even as it's tied up with all the strangeness of the time we're living through. Our ability to be with each other tonight in any way um, uh, is hard won, um, and it's the result of hard work on behalf of all members of our department uh, uh, community. But it also has that flavor, um, as I wrote to all of you last week, of uh, queuing for a ride at Disneyland, uh, a kind of weird spatial theater where we're trying to get back to something that resembles the real true life of this department. And we're almost there, but we turn the corner and there's another half hour wait. So I, I really, really uh, appreciate uh, uh, everyone's uh, uh, cooperation in making this hybrid occasion work tonight and in sitting here with masks on and allowing us to celebrate each other in the way that we can. A condition of almost arrival is an architectural one first and foremost. Um, embedded in our own architectural language are important lessons on how to think about arrival and belonging. The, uh, the English word foyer um, has its origin in the word actually for uh, this kind of vestibule that, that you enter in, but also for hearth and home. And so I think our task here this semester, both with all of you here and with all of you watching us online, is to try and find each other and to try and create a home in this space of continuous, not quite, arrival. In this spirit, we've convened our lecture series, our fall 2021 public program, a continuing set of conversations, as we wrote to you all, on where we are now. Our events explore the department's home at the intersection of design and research with visionary symbolism, extraordinary mechanics, decolonial maneuvers, new methods of computation, situated technologies, and design research all at the foreground. We have spaceships in the desert, conversations on care, and above all, a belief in the enduring power of defiant optimism. It is not to me to introduce our first speaker tonight, um, Sanford Biggers, but I will give particular thanks and introduction to Brandon Clifford, at the director of our Masters of Architecture program for his um, uh, incredible and institutional help in bringing Sanford to us at MIT, not just for tonight, but for an entire year to join this community and join the community as, of MIT as a whole as one of its uh, member of one of its most distinguished programs, the Martin Luther King Visiting Scholars Program. So with that, I give uh, the microphone over to Brandon with care and thanks, and I'm gonna do my mask maneuver as well, and then we're gonna make it happen. Thank you, Nicholas. Hello, everyone. It is a real pleasure to be able to give this introduction tonight. Um, I'm here to introduce Sanford Biggers. But first, Sanford, we are a very small school driven to make a very big impact into the world. And this is a part of the school. We're having a conversation tonight that's being broadcast out to the rest of the school in the lawn. We saw that earlier. We are all very excited to have you here and on behalf of the community, I just want to welcome you as a faculty member of the MIT Department of Architecture. Okay, so now for the audience. Sanford Biggers is a ghost, a specter, a vision. For those of you in the room who are convinced that Sanford is real, I assure you that he is not. Sanford lives in a state of reality that transcends time and culture. He acts as a collaborator with the past by exploring topics that are all too often overlooked. Topics that range from cultural identity to police brutality. It wouldn't shock me to hear Sanford stitching together concepts of cryptocurrency with spirituality. Through his work, 
Sanford manages to identify the essential and latent concepts of our time. He manages, excuse me, he manifests work that evoke visceral, contemplative, and illuminated responses from the very society he reflects. And for this work, he has received a fair amount of recognition. His work is held in permanent collection at MoMA, the Met, the Whitney, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Walker Center in Minneapolis, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. His work has been, on, has been shown at countless institutions from the Minnell Collection to Tate Modern, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the ICA Boston, the Barnes Foundation, and many others. This year alone, Sanford opened a solo exhibition entitled Code Switch at the Bronx Museum. It had 50 quilt-based works that are now on exhibit at the California African American Museum in LA. Not only did he have this show, but he also debuted Oracle, a monumental bronze chimera sculpture, along with many other multimedia works exhibited throughout Rockefeller Center. So Sanford has joined us here in the Department of Architecture at MIT as the current Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. visiting professor and scholar. This very prestigious position follows a string of other awards and fellowships, including the Define Art Award from the Savannah College of Art and Design, a Guggenheim Fellowship. Sanford is currently the board president at the Sculpture Center in New York, and he was inducted into the New York Foundation for the Arts Hall of Fame. He has an American Academy of Arts and Letters Award. And in 2017, he was a Visual Arts Fellow at the American Academy in Rome. This is also known as the Rome Prize. That is where I met Sanford, along with John Oxendorf. And um, this is important because everything I've mentioned in this introduction so far has happened since we met Sanford. It was not that long ago. It's amazing. Uh, so I think there are two ways of reading this. One is that I have somehow had a profound impact on Sanford's career trajectory. Or more likely, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that writing an introduction to Sanford Biggers is an incredibly humbling experience and has questioned my career at its core. <laughs> so uh, if I go just a little bit deeper into history, Sanford's work is featured at the Whitney Biennial, as well as the historic freestyle exhibition at the Studio Museum in Harlem. So all of this is just to say that Sanford is an absolute titan of the art world. Now the question is, why is Sanford joining us here at the School of Architecture? Well, not only is he a devoted um, artist, but he's a devoted mentor and teacher having served as the faculty at Columbia University and as a visiting professor of visual and environmental studies at Harvard. So here we are, a school composed of a variety of disciplines that surround this elusive concept that we call architecture. And um, what will inevitably be, what will inevitably become clear over the course of this evening is that while Sanford operates as a conceptual artist, his creative approach is no way bound by a single discipline. Rather, he thrives on provocative transdisciplinary collaboration. And with all of this, I have not even gotten to the point of sharing that you are the front man of Moon Medicine. So at this point, everyone's getting tired of my introduction and very excited to hear from you, Sanford. So if you can all join me in a warm welcome, uh, the man, the ghost, the specter, Sanford Biggers.
Harriet Tubman grew up as a slave in the 19th century. She was born and raised in the South. She had many jobs, one of them being a slave. She wanted to escape, but she knew it wouldn't be easy. Polishes his suit and tie, his smile is a lie. The die is cast, the metal forms, they're drunk off the high. But little do they realize he's counting on time, he's ready. It's dry by the day, there's life in their bed. Scoffing at the bourbon sun that left them for dead. The coated quilt has given word, the train leaves tonight. They're ready. Good evening. Good evening. It's been a while. Last time I saw people was what, a year and a half, two years ago or so? I haven't done one of these in quite some time. Excuse me if I'm a little bit dusty. Objects have power. In the 20th century, Marcel Duchamp took a trip to the Congo and he made this work. You don't see this in many collections. You don't see this in many institutions. But this is how ideas travel. There is a book called The Hangman's House. I was living in Baltimore, and they were getting rid of books from one of the libraries. And I happened to pick up hundreds of them to make an installation. But the one that stuck with me was this one, not because of the content, but because of the title, The Hangman's House. And I was obsessed at that moment with the history of lynching in the US. Um, it sounds like a pretty morbid thing to be obsessed with, but it's not quite history. It's actually our present. It's our continuum. So when I found this book, I wanted to give it its own ritual. Many of you are familiar with Enkisi and various objects that you might find at an encyclopedic museum that are embedded with nails and shards of glass and mirror. You see these frequently in various societies throughout Africa. And one of the ideas is that you could turn an object into a talisman or even a spiritual guard that warns intruders within that community that that 
that group of people is very, they're very powerful and the amount of nails and the accumulation of those sharp objects dictates that. In this gesture, I was hoping to somehow ameliorate the history, the pathology of what happens here in our country. Now, what I'm not showing you is the performance, I would say, I wouldn't even call it a performance, but documentations of putting these objects to use. I took these out into the suburbs of Chicago. I was, at that time, a graduate student at the Art Institute of Chicago, and I wanted to figure out a way to give work a patina, not just found objects that you can find that already have a certain use patina already on them, but to embed them with something more personal, more actualized by me, the maker. So I went out to the suburbs uh, around 6 a.m. I wore a suit and tie. I sat at a lunch counter, along with several other commuting businessmen who had their newspapers and briefcases. And I held this as my newspaper, and the Duchamp and the Congo piece was my briefcase. And of course, I got strange looks at the, uh, the diner. But then I walked out and got on the commuter train where I got even more strange looks. And it was a crowded morning, so I had to walk up and down the aisles a few times before I could find a vacant seat. And when I finally found one by this diminutive, older woman, blue-haired, reading spectacles, buried into a book, I sat down with this you know, gnarly book and the suitcase, and she looked at me and just dropped her glasses a little bit and said, is that an Nkisi? And I was shocked. Turns out she was a docent at one of the museums and she worked in the African section. Out of all the hundreds of people on that train, this is the woman who I sat by. And she spoke about all of these various objects from different societies with a great deal of zeal, enthusiasm, and knowledge. And once again, I realized that nothing really happens by accident. So as I'm trying to imbue these with some type of experience, I in turn receive this experience that shows me that the world is not as close-minded as you may think sometimes. You just really got to dig deep and find the people <laughs> who have open minds. So imbuing objects. Um, around that same time, I started to make mandala floor pieces partly influenced by Carl Andre, partially influenced by the three years I'd spent living in Japan and going to different um, temples and seated meditation, guided meditation that I received from monks in Japan. And I came back to the US and wanted to make work that was autobiographical, but not featuring my body or a body for the most part. So this was one of those first projects. This is around 16 feet by 16 feet. And as you see, it's hand-cut rubber tiles that are configured to look like a mandala. But once again, to imbue this and charge this with some type of, uh, uh, let's say, um, performative or actionable type of intent, I took this to various contests throughout Chicago and New York City. And I put a video, video camera above them and started to record breakdancers. <laughs> autobiographical in the sense that I grew up with all the hip hop arts, break dancing, rapping, graffiti, and DJing. Um, I was never a good rapper, but I was good at the other stuff. Um, and I got busted for doing graffiti on the side of a building in Los Angeles when I was around 15. And the cops, they were nice. 
I wasn't arrested, I was held. My parents came in, everyone scared the life out of me. And the next day I enrolled in AP art classes. So that started my formal education as a, an artist. Um, this event right here, this project right here, I think, you know, as interesting as it is to me in terms of fusing aspects of art history and performance, it's really a testimony to not trying to fit tidily to any one specific genre within that industry or in that field. So this specific piece, when it's exhibited, is usually put on the floor in a silent room on an adjacent wall, there's a very small monitor. And when I say small, I'm talking two by three inches embedded inside the actual wall. So you don't even know that it's there unless you really look around. The main experience is getting on the dance floor yourself. And you're prompted to do so because you see all the scuff marks that are circling and, and demarcated on the floor. It accumulates a lot of scuff. And to me, that's the use patina. That shows what its function is. When you finally find that monitor, you are then sort of in between being minuscule when you're on the dance floor and gigantic when you're looking at the small monitor. And you know, essentially, I think like many artists are, it was an attempt in making some type of a lo-fi transcendent experience. Um, and also to break down some of the curatorial and institutional issues within museums at the time. Because whenever this is shown, whether it be in Japan or Paris or somewhere in Germany or in New York City or wherever it might be, a few hours per week, people are invited to come in and dance on the floor. So it separates that boundary between art that you can and cannot touch. It makes everybody a performer. Even the person who just walks across it is now in league with these same break dancers right here. So in some ways, so, uh, an attempt at community building, but also breaking down some of the barriers um, for people that don't feel that they are welcomed in these institutions. Not only are they welcomed to see, to see this, they're actually asked to participate. And it's biographical because, you know, obviously me being a break dancer and a graffiti artist, I return to some of these forms a lot. So what you're looking at here is actually the Sanskrit symbol of Om done in a graffiti style. And this one is made out of poured sand. So each grain is put there. In fact, this is a better image. It shows you how the process works, at least my process. I do not follow the Tibetan process. I made my own way of doing it. Um, and it is a curatorial nightmare because most curators are scared that, anyone, that people will walk through it or it will disappear or that they put all this money to have this thing done and it's ephemeral. Um, I think that's also sort of, uh, you know, the fugitive aspect of what I do. Um, and even more interesting than that is sometimes you would just come to the gallery and you'll see mouse tracks, all the vermin that are there when everyone's gone that traverse across this. So I did a much larger one um, in an abandoned warehouse in New York City, and this one was 20 feet by 40 feet. I think the dimensions are incorrect on this one, so don't pay attention to that. Uh, 24 by uh, 40 feet. And this is a rendition of a sixth century prayer rug. And this was also done fully in sand, and at the opening there was probably two or 300 people walking around, and at one point, um, a little girl around six years old freaked out and she ran right across it. Um, I already took the pictures, so I was fine. It's an ephemeral piece. Most people don't believe it's even sand until something like that happens where they realize, oh my God, that thing could just be disrupted by a sneeze. Um, and she was light enough where she just left a couple of smudges and a little footprint and instead of everyone freaking out, they actually applauded her. She cried and ran out totally embarrassed. Um, but I'm telling you, telling you this story, and for the people that saw this show, at the end of the day, that memory is probably more poignant than the work itself. So I think I, in addition to making things, I'm really trying to make experiences, experiences that I can't control, things that live in other people as they traverse experience, uh, share stories about these pieces in the future. Um, so I mentioned that I lived in Japan for three years, and around a decade after that, I was invited back to do a residency. And I did a project where I wanted to, do, to investigate transubstantiation. And to do that, I took hip hop jewelry, fat gold chains, necklaces, rings that I got on 125th Street and throughout the Bronx and Harlem. And then again in Tokyo, I did the same thing. I bought a bunch of hip hop jewelry there. And I worked with a few different artisans throughout Tokyo to melt all of that down into an alloy. And then we pressed these into what are called orin in Japanese, but singing bowls. Many of you have seen these. You can rub 
a mallet across the top and it starts to make a very beautiful sound. It's a meditative device. These are often seen in small scale in home shrines. Um, I think it comes from Shinto originally, but also you find it throughout Buddhism and various other cultures. Um, and then stamped on it, it says literally, um, in fond memory of hip hop, hip hop nisasogu. I think this was around 2004. And I'm sure all of you remember when Nas came out with the album, Hip Hop Is Dead in 2005. Uh, it's his birthday, by the way, I think. So I took that to a temple that I was doing seated meditation with, for, uh, with a, the head monk for around two months. And um, I don't know how many of you are very familiar with customs in Japan, but I could not ask to do a performance there. I could suggest that maybe it would be nice to do a performance there, to which the monk was like, ah, we've spent so much time. It would perhaps be nice for you to do that, which was his way of saying yes. So we set up a few of my bowls with a few of the temple's bowls, and they had bowls that went 200, 300 years um, you know, back. And we did a bell ceremony, which was lit literally an improvised bell chorus. And once again, I don't know how many of you know Japan well, but improvisation is not the highest thing on the list of things to do in Japan. So it was very difficult to get that to happen, but I did it with a diagram, and we were able to pull this off. And the final striking was the head monk himself hitting the one that says hip hop nisasugu. Um, so mandalas, I was still very much deep into exploring these ideas of these uh, symbols from Buddhism specifically, and that gradually went on to other societies and different religions, and actually trying to find some syncretism between them all, and not to really point out their differences, but where at the core there were similarities. Um, in this case, I'm taking the mandala, and I was commissioned to do a piece at the, um, the Rubin Museum. Well, first, let me take that back a little bit. I was commissioned to do a piece in Kansas City, and that's where I originally made this piece, which would later be viewed at a Buddhist museum in New York City. And this is a lotus. The lotus blossom, of course, is a symbol of wholeness, um, uh, purity, transcendence, um, as it grows from the muck and mire to become this beautiful blossom. And this particular lotus is hand etched into glass, 84 inches diameter, weighs around 600 pounds or so. and it was later hung in the middle of a circular stairwell at the Rubin Museum. But as you can see on that image on the right, was that the closer you get and the more you can, the closer you can see the details of each petal, you realize that they're actually um, cross sections of slave ships. And these are from diagrams from slavers who would show up the best way to pack human cargo for efficiency and for profit. And these particular, this particular lotus has over 6,000 hand-carved pieces in there. And then I was later commissioned by the city of New York to do a large version of that on the side of the Eagle Academy for Young Men, which is a school in uh, the Bronx. And it was a battle to do this piece. I was selected, and I had to propose this. And there was a lot of pushback because of some of the demographic of that school not wanting to own the fact that there was slavery in the US, which was strange to me because this was not really making any moral decision or moral uh, political notion about it. It's just a factual thing, and I'm trying to make a transcendent device, but it was so much pushback that it took around three or four months longer to approve this than most of the other projects. In fact, at the end of the day, I'm shocked that it even happened. But it's still there. This is 29 feet or close to 30 feet diameter and steel on the side of the building. And I just have a little 29 foot, sorry, picture of us making that at the studio. And I'm showing you some of this because you'll see these mot motifs. They reoccur throughout a lot of my work. Uh, this is a print series that I did with Columbia University a few years ago. And that's more of a graphic depiction of that. And the idea when I made that in the first place was to gradually start to degrade it more and more. So at the end of the day, it becomes almost like an icon. You do not see the detail of it, but you know what it stands for. And it's sort of like a never forget and transcend those tribulations type of message behind it.
Uh, this piece is called Blossom, and it's a reconstructed piano that is turned into a MIDI player piano. And what you were listening to is my version, my own rendition of the jazz standard Strange Fruit, um, which, of course, is about bodies swinging in the southern breeze. And the tree that is uprooting the piano is um, a sculpted tree. It's made out of steel and zoopoxy and, and resin and silk leaves. It comes apart in three or four different pieces. And when it's fully constructed, this is sort of the scale and the impact it has. And you see the piano bench right in front of it that is kicked over as if a body might have been lynched. And this was really a response to the Gina 6 incident that happened in Louisiana around 2007, 2008, um, which started at a relatively integrated school in Gina, in Gina where one day a black student wanted to sit with a group of white students under the poplar kid tree. And the, asked the teacher if he could go sit there. The teacher, of course, said yes. He goes over and sits there. A few minutes later, the white students start to leave. The next morning, there's nooses hanging from the tree. And this incident goes on for several months until it culminates with a fight between some white kids and black kids in front of a convenience store. The white kids pull a gun. The black kids beat up the white kids and take the gun. The black kids get arrested for stealing the gun. And some of them went to jail. And then that's when all the protesters started to descend into Gina. So once again, you know, recurring motifs. Um, and I made this piece, I think this was 2007 when it was made. And up very, very high above is uh, another piece called Cheshire, which is a Cheshire grin. Um, once again, this is a dichotomous piece, of course. I originally made that piece when I was doing a residency in Stuttgart, Germany. And I hung that in the Black Forest. And with the reference of Cheshire, everyone, of course, thought Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland. I showed the same piece in Richmond, Virginia, and everyone immediately thought blackface minstrelsy. And that's a very interesting point to me, that the same exact symbol could hold so much specific gravity, depending on the context of, and the viewership. And that brings us to a series of paintings that I've been working on for the last decade or so. And this is called the Codex series, and it started when I was doing an installation in Philadelphia where artists were asked to re-envision some um, very historic um, buildings, residences, and I'm sorry. Yes, people were asked to re-envision some historic places throughout Philadelphia that had gone to disrepair and basically forgotten. And I chose the Mother Bethel Church, which was a very important spot um, a stop along the Underground Railroad. And I was originally going to do an installation that involved stained glass. But for some reason, when I was in Philadelphia, I kept being shown different places. And there were all these quilt exhibitions. And then I read about this rumored um, past that, history, uh, that quilts were used as signposts along the Underground Railroad. And potentially, people were getting map directions and hidden messages through the codes or the combinations of symbols or the colors on the quilt or the way it might have been hung or draped outside of a home. Um, historians have debated that, if it's true or not, for many, many years. But as vernacular history, and <clears throat> it held enough interest for me to start considering myself a late contributor of code along these, inside, embedded in these quilts. So while I was there, too, I also kept seeing the image of Gordon the slave. And this is also a very famous image. Um, it's in the Library of Congress. It's used many, many times. This was um, used by abolitionists to show the atrocities of slavery. Gordon was an escaped slave who apparently, as the story goes, would put onions in his pocket. So as he was escaping, he would rub his body down with onions so the dogs wouldn't find him. And after he would swim through water, every time he got out, he'd refresh the onions so, no, so dogs couldn't find him. And he finally made his way to a Union Army camp. And um, later joined the Union Army and fought a few times, apparently. There's a movie. I just found this out like three days ago. Apparently, Will Smith is making a movie about this. So we'll see how that goes. But anyway, I was fascinated by the scarification on the back and how that started to remind me of star charts. And I started thinking deeper about that and made a map, an overhead map of Philadelphia, where I started to make um, find the, the areas where official Underground Railroad stops and Underground Railroad stations were throughout Philadelphia. 
and I made this star chart, this, this map of them, and if you went to those various locations, so part of my installation, it started in Mother Bethel, but I had little lotus, right there, little lotus swatches made, and I left them at all those locations. So if you made yourself, if you got all the way around the city to all those locations, you can pick these up and then use them however you wanted to. And then also, I started making constellations from those scars on Gordon's back. And of course, these were heavily abstracted at this point, but what you're looking at are the codes. So this is sort of the star, the constellation that's made from some of the scars. You see footprints in there that imply, you know, travel, escape, and of course, the lotus. And that was the first one I did, and it was for conceptual insulation, basically, but I found myself being more and more drawn to these, these as found objects, but also as canvases. And I had a studio visit where a collector, on her way out, said that she used to sell quilts. And she hadn't in many years, so they were just gathering moth holes in her closet. And she asked me if I wanted some. And she gave me basically 30 different quilts. And that's when I started this practice of painting on them. So over the years, I've developed all kinds of symbols to put on them. I work with any material I find, tar, glitter, oil, acrylic, spray paint, um, charcoal, burnt cork, uh, you name it. This one, you can see the Cheshire grin on its side throughout the whole piece. This one has tar, glitter, and assorted fabrics. This one has uh, two-tone sequins that I put on there, and then I draw directly into the sequins to create the uh, tumbling block effect. And again, from that print series from Columbia, you see the silhouette of Gordon on the side. So once again, recurring motifs. And although I haven't spoken much about music yet, I will at some point, but a lot of my practice derives some of its directives from themes in music and reoccurring themes, variations on themes, motifs, and choruses. I think there's visual counterpoints to that. Um, but you know, also you can see in some of the quilt paintings that I'm also pushing trompe l'oeil and perspective. And for me, the logical progression was then to start making three-dimensional objects from that. So what you're looking at right here is what I basically call a hyper object, but it is a three-dimensional wooden plywood armature that has different pieces of quilt mounted to it. That's a straight ahead view. That's a side view. And that gives you an idea of the scale. And I'm just gonna rush through a few images. This is from my solo exhibition that started at the Bronx Museum, as Brandon mentioned, and is now on view in Los Angeles. Um, this was the first iteration. So this opened in September last year, and it went till April. And the quilt that you're looking at, I don't have a detail of that, but those two white marks in the center are actually cut out from the quilt, so that's another um, part of the exploration is now literally using the negative space and then pushing ideas of illusion, optical illusion and perspective and trompe l'oeil. And these are several, this is the iteration now that's at, um, in Los Angeles. And this was a per particularly uh, meaningful place for me to show because this is the museum that I used to go for Saturday art classes after I got busted for doing graffiti. <laughs> And in the corner, you see a very large version of one of the three-dimensional quilts. That one is called Kubrick's Rube. I think we have some more details coming up, but. And also in, well, in the iteration at the Bronx, you see the projected image of that mandala dance floor. That is right there on the floor there. That was also a nod to the fact that the first museum that showed that dance floor was also the Bronx Museum in 2003 or 2004 in a group exhibition. And not only that, the film footage that you saw was from a breakdance competition that happened in the Bronx at the Bronx Community College. And I worked on those floor pieces for around five or six years, the sand pieces and the dance floors, until it ruined my knees and I could no longer do it. And I stopped making that kind of work altogether until I got to the quilts, and that's where the sacred geometry and the patterning came back into the work. So I consider those to be totally related. And 
If you notice that I don't really use the figure all that much, I show ghosts and specters, I don't really show full figures. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that we can go into maybe in the Q&A, um, but I realized that I was actually dealing with the figure when I started dealing with quilts, because the figure is always implied. And not only are the quilts two-dimensional objects, they are performative objects because their first purpose is to comfort and keep people warm. So even without the body being present, the body is implied. And that perf performative aspect is implied. Um, and then, you know, more reactionary work happens through all of that, and I started to feel a little bit more um, agency with using the figure again, and I started the BAM series. For this series of work, I was basically taking um, figures from different cultures throughout Africa, some of them being really authentic um, objects from as long as 100 years ago, all the way to Chotsky's, all the way to stuff that I might find in Harlem on 125th Street. And the whole idea is that all of the figures at the end of the day have some degree of, of doubt. They're dubious. They come from dubious origins. And this is something that led to my tenure at the American Academy in Rome, was finding what the origins of a lot of these figurative symbols end up meaning for us. So after I would shoot those, um, I would get the objects, dip them in wax, I would take them to a shooting range, and the sculpting really was happening with guns. I was shooting them with, with nine millimeters and 12 gauge shotguns and 22s and 45s and so on. And obviously each different caliber leaves a different type of mark. And once I finished the shooting process, I would take the remnants and cast them in bronze. And then I would name them after victims of police brutality. And there's precedence for this type of, you know, sort of, you know, grotesque work. Um, I was particularly interested in some of de Kooning's Clam Digger and Head series. He did a bunch of bronzes that were these really dis sort of disfigured, abstracted, forms, and I know this is also very morbid, I was also very obsessed with the image of Emmett Till after you know, the castration and beating, and after they found his body bloated after being put in the bottom of a river. And all of this was coming together in this body of work for me. So I'm just gonna zoom through a couple of different images from that series. And I sometimes just show the single videos of you know, the singular object being shot, but then I started to make compositions from the videos that were video, standalone video pieces like this. So these are, what, five video monitors on their side, and there's a choreography between how the imagery displays on each um, monitor. So for example, you might see the bullet come in from the left and shoot all the way across all the monitors through the right. So each one has a different channel, so the action is different. So it becomes almost a very choreographed experience to see this work. And then at one point I was commissioned by the Equal Justice Initiative, which is a new museum that's dedicated to um, the history of incarceration and abduction from Africa that um, Brian Stevenson opened up a few years ago. And this is literally the final object you see as you make your way through the entire museum. This is what leads you out the door. Um, and this is a nine-foot version of it with the monitor on the side showing its process. And then I started working in marble, um, and this is obviously very influenced by my time in Rome, and I started a series of works that are called the Chimera series, and these are hybrid forms that come from Greco-Roman objects, neoclassical objects, and African objects. Once again, all of these are from dubious origins because as I would start to research, various uh, sort of um, canonical works throughout Europe, I realized that so many of them were reproductions, and then not only were there reproductions, there were new works that were based off of poses from the supposed classics. And not only that, a lot of those pieces that we see today and think of as eternally monochromatic white pieces 
were often painted and colored various with different pigments. So the only reason we know them as alabaster white or monochromatic white is because of weathering in time. And that made me think also the fact that I'd never seen an African object done in marble. I've seen them in bronze and wood, but never marble. So there was a bit of curiosity there too. So I started to create these chimera, which are, they're, they're monsters of sorts. They are the monsters of, uh, of hybridized culture, of history, of pathology, of all of those things. But at the same time, they're very beautiful. And the deeper I get into the, prog the process, I realize that it goes back to one of the most important aspects of sculpture in the first place, and that's just gesture and how the body and the attitude of each of these forms convey different ideas. And also, I think this goes back to, you know, being a child of hip hop and rap music and sampling and cutting and pasting and chopping and screwing and all of those different processes that we take for granted these days, but it became a mode of production for me. Oh, I didn't give you any names, I'm sorry. Let me go back a few. This one is called A Love Supreme. Um, I can't remember the name of this one. Oh, Le Roi, my French is horrible. L-E-R-O-I, the king. But anglicize, it's Leroy. This one's called The Caress. And this is from a show uh, towards the end of last year at Marianne Bosky Gallery in New York City. And many of you probably recognize those four central columns as part of the Athenian Acropolis. And um, this particular piece, they are cut out and now lying flaccid on the floor. And if I remember correctly, my proposal to go to the American Academy in Rome was about the uh, fall of empire and looking at these objects as ways of signifying various falls of empire. Um, and this one, obviously, from those rigid forms become these flaccid ruins. And it's flanked by two other marble pieces. The Ascendant. And Canigula. Oh, humor happens too. Um, the quilt piece up there uh, on the side is called the charlatan. And you've already seen this one. And this is where I first showed the uh, Kubrick's, Kubrick's Rube piece that later moved to the Los Angeles show. So I'm gonna run through a few very quickly. This right here was the first time that one of the marbles and the bronzes actually were shown together. Um, and I would love to do a show strictly with marbles and bronze, bronzes because I think there's an incredible dialogue that's happening with these works now. Um, this stuff is very fresh and I've never spoken about this uh, publicly. So I'm still formulating thoughts on some of this and I do not want to uh, say anything that is untrue to these. And Though this isn't the most recent piece, this is one of the most recent major installations. Of course, this is Oracle, and this was at Rockefeller Center from May to uh, mid-July. And this is 30 feet. Uh, well, the bronze itself is 25 feet, but it's on a five-foot uh, riser, so ultimately a 30-foot piece. And you can sort of see how that scale is operating amongst the tall buildings there. There's a few different views of that piece. And this is the largest chimera I've done, and it's the only chimera that exists in bronze at this point. Um, but what most people, and you know, this got a lot of coverage. Uh, it went pretty viral online in terms of uh, the coverage of the piece and the press coverage of it. But a lot of people don't realize that this was merely one part of a 17-piece installation throughout the entire plaza at Rockefeller Center, which included the flags that go around the skating rink, and for those, I did this uh, installation called Segaiha, which are basically um, renditions of waves and water forms that you see in mandalas, tankas, 
and um, Okiue paintings and Hiroshige paintings. And I drew them and then smudged them and scumbled them with an eraser. And the idea of having them up in a serial installation was when the waves and when the wind would blow, the waves would animate. And inside the building were several in smaller installations. These are three chimera forms. And the backdrops of these forms are video stills from a video project that I did in Ethiopia and Brazil. And I'm using those as the backdrop for these forms, creating the, I guess, the landscape or, or the cosmic landscape that they might land from or hail from. And I also started engaging in virtual reality for this project. There's a QR code that was um, near each of the pieces and you can run your phone by it. And let's see, I think you could bring some of those objects into the space and they were monumental when they were in the space. And in all honesty, that whole installation in Rockefeller Center to me was basically part one of a much larger installation. And I think the, the virtual reality aspect of that was a way of showing the scale of how all of these objects might exist in the real campus that they may have come from. And throughout the various lobby were different paintings. Um, this is an exhibition that's still up right now in um, Kinderhook, New York. I have four pieces in that show. Um, one of them is this, um, this almost mural-sized quilt piece that's called Slim. Slim is actually the nickname of Trayvon Martin. And this is a portrait that I made of Trayvon from the police photograph of his body laying down on the lawn after he was killed. But in this case, of course, I flipped it up and now he's ascending. and another marble piece that's also in that exhibition called God Whistle. And I'm not gonna say much about it, but as Brandon alluded to, um, I am the lead of a group called Moon Medicine uh, that is a conceptual band. We do performances wearing full costume and masks with video as a huge component of it in the back. And uh, this is us playing at Lincoln Center. So much, so much blue, blue. So, so much, much beauty, blue. so much used and misused and abused. So we dance. You the type to make slaves, and we the type to free them. We dance. Changing faces every night, we call them how we see them. So we dance, dance, sucker. We dance on the equinox. Yes, we dance. You ain't never had to suffer. You ain't felt that strain. Daddy bought your life, it came with your last name. Yet you partying and drinking, trying to kill the pain. So you dance, sucker.
the rhythm is living. We, yes, we dance. Some dance for chicken. Expecting me to jump every time your fingers snap. What's elevated to your ranks is really just a trap. Nah, baby, we ain't had to go to school to learn that. So we bought into the pipe dream, now we want our money back. So we dance. So. Thank you so much, Sanford. I'll keep my mask on. You can take yours off. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Good. It was incredible. So there's something that caught my attention where you paused to speak about the new work. And I understand tonight you were, you were sharing a bit of, um, you know, you gave us a bit of the hits, some of the new work. You're giving us a kind of life's work up until today. Um, and I just want to reflect a bit as people are thinking of their own questions to be passing up here. Um, how you make decisions about when you move from a series to these cataclysmic shifts. Like we see things like the Lotus work popping up again and again. We see it in a series, like a linear series where you've crafted that series together and then it might disappear and then you have a cataclysmic shift where you move into the Chimera series. And I wouldn't be shocked to see Lotus somehow being embedded into one of the chimeras. So that's what I'm wondering is like, what is that capital P project? How do you think about individual projects, series of projects, and then when you take that moment to shift from media? Um, is, it po is it possible? Okay. It's gonna be hard for you to see, but if you look at the throne that the Oracle is sitting on, you see several Lotuses. <laughs> going all the way across. So the idea is developing a language that allows me to traverse different materials and even different themes and start pulling some of those visual cues back into the work. Um, it's a way of, in some ways, grounding the work for me, but it's not really planned out. I'm imagining 20 years, 70 years from now, if I'm still here, <laughs> the, to be able to look back at the work and see how those ideas develop through those signifiers. Um, I don't consider anything to be totally done because the minute you move into a new place, it takes on a new meaning and, and you know, it, it has the ability to be malleable that way. Um, but some of those elements that you see that continue are a way of grounding them and linking them together, I think. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's what's so powerful about the idea of the Cheshire is that depending on where it's presented, which culture, an entirely different meaning would take place. Um, 
so I, I'm kind of, uh, I'm curious about if you can walk us through the origins of these projects, because what I'm seeing it, as you have a recurrence of these ideas and you're exploring them, sometimes you shift medium, but sometimes you just continue to produce and produce and produce. Mm -hmm. It feels like you're seeking something. You're re we would use the term research at MIT. Like you're just after it and you're going. This is very different from an idea of having a concept and delivering one piece and stepping away and it's off in the world. Mm -hmm. So this is like this continual search that you have. I'm wondering how much of that is that you're after something and how much is the work surprising you in turn? It is about the surprise, um, I think. Um, part of that research is because you know that you haven't really got to whatever, quote unquote, the core is. And I don't really think I want to get to the core. I like playing and experimenting around the periphery of the core. Um, I think it's for other people, historians, writers, to find cores for themselves. Mm. Uh, I don't want to be so prescriptive as to say the work is about this and this is the thing. Um, it's really about the process. And art, visual art is a place where you can experiment and express in that way because nothing is about, it's, it's, there's no fact. I mean, it's all true and it's mm. all lies. And I think that's sort of beautiful. Well, you brought up vernacular history earlier. And I'm wondering what your connection to truth is. Because in, in that moment, you're very open to the idea that a history, something that's written down in the Eurocentric model, um, becomes truth somehow. That because we write it down and someone verifies that someone so wrote it down and then someone else verifies that, that that becomes a societal truth. And the vernacular history to you seemed to be much more valuable. Oral histories. And that's where I'm wondering is like, how much does truth as a, as a concept, I mean, are, are you seeking truth or are you playing with truth? I mean, I think the only truth is the process. That's sort of the point. Um, I think we're all witnessing a moment where we're realizing that truth is open source. And it's really who speaks the truth the loudest or, you know, proliferates our attention span with their truth, mm. trying to convince us that it is in fact true, is a process that we're literally watching happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and we know there are some things that are like immutable truths, I think. Um, like? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, the sun theoretically will come up again tomorrow, mm -hmm. or at least the next day. That one we can work with, right? That's probably gonna happen. There might be a point where it doesn't, but for the foreseeable future, that's probably gonna happen. Now, should we enter into Buddhist philosophy on truth here? Well, I don't know, what do you think? Well, well, well you no, no, we'll continue, I'm sorry, I'm just uh, <laughs> <laughs> trying to get you going, basically. Well, no, but I, I mean, you know, to some degree, and yeah, this is a provocative statement, I think there is malleability in truth, um, and there is malleability in history. I think they're both malleable constructs. Um, and time bears them out. You know, there's things that you believe for 100 or 200 years, and then all of a sudden there's a societal shift or a, shift or a cultural shift, and no one believes it anymore. Um, mm. There's all kinds of examples about that. So, you know, I think when we talk about truth and his and truth, we're, we also, you also have to put time into that equation. You know, I think some truths expire. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's great. So I just want to transition to questions from the audience. I mean, one, one of the things that I, I was drawn by uh, your lecture is just how many different ideas are, can be extracted. Um, so here we have one. Could you speak to your next steps in your art with regards to the African context and references in your work? Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, I find myself being very, more and more drawn to abstraction. And that work that has the figure in it and that has some degree of representation does not negate the fact that it could also still be abstract. And in fact, what we're doing is abstracting history, abstracting visual literacy, abstracting truths. We're abstracting things all the time. And I guess part of what I think the variety of my body of work my project represents 
is that I can use all of those aspects, whether it being from one particular group in Africa or one particular group in Europe or one particular group in the US, and start to conflate them all to see how much gravity, how much weight they each hold, or are they in fact interchangeable to some degree? I did a piece when I was in college that was you know, admittedly a horrible piece, but the idea of the piece was that popular icons do fall. And this, once again, speaks to that idea that over time, things that we believe wholeheartedly and somehow start to dissipate, or, or potentially can dissipate, and that icons and images can do the same thing. Like we're talking about the Cheshire and how the meaning shifts in different contexts. So I'm curious, and part of that is an experiment to see how much the gravitas per image, basically. Yeah, you, you were talking a bit uh, with regard to figurative work. Um, you were talking a bit about specters and ghosts in the quilt pieces that are somewhere in between figurative and the sacred geometry that you're working with. Um, and then when we get to the Chimera series, you become interested again in, I guess, the foundation, what, what someone might say is the foundations of sculpture. You're t I think you, the word you were using was uh, gesture? Mm -hmm. oh, gesture, um, yeah. Yep, gesture. So and canonical uh, and yeah, various, yeah. I guess it, it's not, it's never pure in the sense that you're working exclusively through figurative work. That even when you're bringing in figurative work from African sculpture and blending it with European classical sculpture, you are, through that mix, creating something new. I think and it's abstracting both of them. You okay. Know, that's really sort of the goal. In fact, I've written about it and I find myself having a hard time with the linguistics. Like, classical European mm. and African works, or classical European and classical African works, or traditional European and traditional African works. What are the right descriptors? Why do we not use classical African when we know that some of these are also canonical icons and forms that have been in various cultures for presumably hundreds of years there as well? So how do you start to change and grasp how we're putting hierarchical import onto various cultures and not other cultures. And I want to conflate all that in some of that chimera work. That's why I call them monsters too, because this right, is the monster we're right. dealing with. Yes, and it, well tonight I was learning about how the, the research you were doing in Rome, that many of the sculptures are reproductions of other sculptures, copies, and that a lot of the pieces that you're taking um, with the ballistic work with BAM, for instance, the question about what is the authenticity or we can return to truth about, could you talk a little bit about um, this, this kind of cycle of the African sculpture, the tourism market, and then like, if, if, as we think about what, what would the original piece be? Um, well, I think, well, that's a good question because there is an artist right now in Nigeria who's making an object for a tourist that's an authentic African object that is an original. Once again, time is part of this equation. It's no less authentic because it's made today than if it were made 100 years ago. And that same tourist market exists in Rome. You can walk mm -hmm. around and find miniatures of everything right. that's out there. Mm. So this is a common sculptural practice, artistic practice, commerce practice, and it's universal. Mm. Yeah. I, so. I think my question is the wrong question to be asking, right? <laughs> um, here we have, we have another question. So this is getting to experience. And which art piece that you have created curated the most memorable experience for you? Hmm. I think this is a question about the piece surprising you in turn. I think that's another reason I experiment so much because I could say many of them have experiences. I have anecdotes to almost all those works. Um, I remember making the mandala, the large mandala, and I've made six or seven mandalas, but that was the largest one that was used for the dance floor. I remember specifically I was working with uh, my collaborator on that piece, David Ellis. Mm -hmm. Late, 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 late nights, um, you know, no sleep for you know, a week type of thing. I remember D'Angelo was doing a concert downtown New York, and he never plays anywhere. And we had access to the show, but we had a deadline, and we couldn't make that show. But then we had to work in this little warehouse shop that actually was across the street from where he was practicing. So we were able to hear him practice for that gig every night while we were working. So now it's more important to go to work because we actually could hear not just the show, but the mistakes, the outtakes, the improv. We hear all of that stuff. 
across the street. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's one of my memories for that. And then, of course, being in the Bronx and seeing all those people there for the actual show. But you know, I can tell you anecdotes for almost all those, all the pieces. Um, the first time we saw A Love Supreme, The Marble, and that was just a few years ago, when it came to Chicago, and we didn't know how heavy it was going to be, what it was going to look like, how big it was really going to be in that space. You know, the thing weighed 800 pounds, and like, how are we going to move this thing around? Um, and then the first thing that the dealer said was, we need to charge more. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I remember that. Um, anyway, they all have stories. They all have lots of stories. But um, the moon medicine stuff, that is usually, it comes from a different place. The experience is very different. It is ephemeral. It's time-based. It's improvisatory. Um, I'm playing keys and piano in the group, if you guys couldn't tell by the visuals. But those are the projects where I'm the least in control. Even though I'm the band leader and I select the set list and I co-write the music, I feel like I am the least in control. Mm. Everybody up there are professionals. They make their money by playing music. And every time I'm up there, I'm feeling like they are permitting me to be on that stage with them. Even though that's not really the case, but that's where I feel like a novice and, and a student. And it's thrilling. Mm. So l let me ask you a little bit about performance then. Because uh, I think that that's one of those moments where you're, you're talking about empowering an object through the performance. Thinking of the Enkisi piece on the train, right? Mm -hmm. That instead of thinking of the performance as the work itself, that the performance becomes either a way of charging the work, this is a word that you've used, or um, the, other, the other way that I'm curious about is where you're making a piece and then a performance follows it, like for instance, the mandala, mm -hmm. um, or the, the girl walking across. Mm -hmm. uh, that is an, uh, that would have been a surprise, although I'm sure you had it in your head, but it wasn't planned out. Mm -hmm. So uh, the difference that I'm trying to distinguish here is between when you're intentionally making a decision about a performance and when a performance inherently happens to the work itself, where it gains its own life. And how much meaning does that have for you? Uh, I th my answer to that is probably influenced by one of my mentors, uh, the late Terry Adkins. And it's basic jazz fundamental and improvisation fundamental, um, is that I'm actually just creating instances. Something's always going to happen. And I don't know what to anticipate, but I anticipate that thing will happen. Mm -hmm. And I th it's very hard to put this in words, but what I'm really doing is just setting up the opportunity for the unknown to take place. And I think that is a very performative thing. And I think it's a vulnerable thing, but I think it's also a, um, an ecstatic <laughs> affair because you sort of know Something's mm -hmm. going to happen. I don't know what it's going to be this time. I can't wait for that thing to happen. And then it inev in inevitably does happen. Mm. The girl running across happened, and it was that <gasps> gasp from the crowd. I was like, wow, that would be better than an hour-long performance, you know, just that six-second instance. Um, and I can't think of any work of mine or proper installation context where something unexpected like that has happened, Some has not happened. Okay, so uh, I have another question here. So given the autobiographical nature of your work, would you ever return to tagging? Mm. Uh, and they're, they're continuing here to a question about engaging with an audience outside of a gallery or Rockefeller Center. Uh, signed, Graffiti Kid from Jersey. Great question. Um, yeah, I would consider tagging again. Uh, there's a new way, to, the, not tagging in the, tr the, tr the classical sense of tagging. Mm. Um, but I think there's an opportunity for a new type of tagging. And um, my friend from New Jersey probably has some ideas. But considering the space, the cyberspace, the, wor the world we live in right now, and our means to um, distributing information and ideas, there's all kinds, there's so many different forms of tagging. Um, a performative tag, usually when Moon Medicine does something related to an exhibition or in a, an official institution or venue, we usually go to a very unofficial 
late night bootleg spot and do an improvised set. Very before, much before or after. After. Mm -hmm. That's a tag in my way, in a thought. Because there's people who go to that that would never have come to the first part, and vice versa. There's some that might go to both, but very the majority of the crowd at this spot in the juke joint is very different than the one that was over here at the ivory tower. Um, and I commend those who traverse between, but um, I think that's a form of tagging. Yeah, public work is a tag always, and then it gets tagged on, so you get you have to deal with all that. But that 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 idea that you would start to span different audiences, that you're you're shifting and moving. Um, feels very open source to go back to that context. Okay, so the next question is, uh, would you say that pain or violence play a large role in your works? Or perhaps might you categorize the feelings and themes involved differently? I would categorize them differently. I think pain has influenced memory, history, and in some degrees reality. So I would not ignore pain but I don't think my work comes from a place of fear and sadness. In fact, I think it comes from a place of ecstasy and critique sometimes. But amongst that, you know, I think there are myriad feelings or, or um, ideas in the work. Pain is just one. Um, violence happens. Um, there's bodily violence, but I think there's artistic violence too, and I'm a big fan of that. We're talking about graffiti. There's people who think graffiti is violent, whereas others find it beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, taking a found quilt and making marks on it is sacrilege to some people. Am I defacing it or am I embellishing it? I actually really sort of like straddling the line of all of those things and not fitting into one of them. Um, I think that's another thing that's very important right now. Um, Particularly, and this is a really niche art conversation, there has been a huge proliferation of artwork that's been um, championed by African Americans and African and, you know, uh, creators of color um, in general. Um, people say it's trending, they're saying all these various things. But amongst that, the real thing I think you should look for is tone and the variety of tone you're seeing in the work that people are pushing towards you to say, this is hot and this is hot, this is hot. And you know you don't want it. I'm interested in things that have tones that are unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. I think a great artwork can make you cringe. If it can do that, then it's probably a great artwork. If it just makes you smile and oh, you know, swipe left, you know, whatever. Mm. Well, that, that leads perfectly. I've got to say also, thank you for the handwriting that I'm receiving tonight. It's very helpful. Uh, that's that's not sarcasm. <laughs> they're, they're legible. <laughs> so this one has to do with patina. A lot of your work acquires patina, scuff marks, tracks, bullet holes, tears, rips. How do you see the transition to marble and bronze in this context of objects that transform over time? Well, I think the marble does show the, the trace of the hand. If you get close to the pieces, they look super smooth, but you get close and you start to see different uh, blemishes and things that I actually sort of like because they add realism to it. Um, and I don't want to uh, spoil work that might be happening in the future, but I was influenced by ruins, and I've yet to make ruins, and so that's a possibility. Mm, right. um, I tend to construct a bit of a language or a vocabulary only to deconstruct it, um, so you might see deconstructions of various types coming. Right. Okay, so I think we'll take one last question from the audience before treating you to a slightly cooler room. Uh, when constructing the quilts, have you ever had the inclination to engage in a dialogue with your grandfather's murals? Hmm. Um, by grandfather's murals, I'm assuming John Biggers? Is that who grandfather's murals? Let's work under that assumption since these are anonymous questions. So um, John was actually a cousin, but if that's what we're talking about. Um, I, what I didn't show, I, you know what, I did yeah. a very large installation at Mass Mocha um, in 2011, and I showed a quilt painting in the upper mezzanine, and I did a full-scale reproduction of one John, of John Bigger's murals, that's called The Quilting Party. And John Bigger's work was a mixture of figurative work and sacred geometrical work, figurative geometry, all this, you know, uh, figurative abstraction, all this stuff was happening um, in his murals. 
And I actually think his work influenced me to do anything related to patterns and geometry in the first place. That includes the breakdance floors and all of that, the mandalas. I think that was coming from the tradition set by John Biggers of using geometrical forms in his artwork. I wanted to find a way of incorporating some of that language and then putting my own spin on it. <laughs> no pun intended with breakdancers, but. Um, and then, you know, obviously that's gone into the quilts and so on. So they're totally related, and I'm glad somebody asked that question because you guys are really paying attention. That's good. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Sanford. Uh, I'm going to pass the mic to Nicholas here. I think we can also, in the meantime, give a very warm round of applause. And thank you, Sanford. Thank you. So it falls to me to um, uh, conclude our lecture tonight in the most important way with thanks first and foremost to Sanford for an amazing, mind-blowing beginning to our journey together for this year. Uh, I also want to thank, if anyone's left out there, um, I want to thank our Architecture Student uh, uh, Council, or ASC, for the, for the uh, outdoor jumbotron they set up at their picnic to allow uh, all of us to enjoy this lecture together, whether inside or outside. And then I also wanted to uh, give particular thanks in the context of Inside and Outside um, to the support and co-sponsorship of this lecture by the Art, Culture and Technology Program or Art Program that's lodged here within our department. Um, uh, I think this uh, is, is part of our excitement and our uh, entire justification for having Sanford uh, here this year is the very special story at the MIT Department of Architecture of a constant dialogue between those inside and outside architecture um, and different kinds of creative realms, of course, from Kyrgyz Kepes to the spatial architectures of Joan Jonas to our own Azra Akshamija, the director of the Art, Culture and Technology Program and artist and architect both here with us tonight. Um, it's part of the special work we do here at MIT and the work that uh, Sanford will be instrumental in um, shaping and influencing this year. So with that, I invite you to join us again next week for Vernell Noel um, in a lecture uh, hosted by the me, computation <laughs> group uh, uh, in our public lecture series um, uh, titled Situation, Computations, Craft and Technology. And the title alone, again, should tell us something about who we are and what we do here. So thank you again, uh, Sanford. Thank you again, audience here. Thank you, audience outside and audience online whose uh, questions were also part of the dialogue here tonight. Good night and see you next week. <laughs>